Welcome back to Cards and Comics. And today on this episode of Hobby Talk, I want to talk about this idea of preparing for the national and really what the national sports card show really is all about and the how it's reached this kind of mythological status in the hobby. So I've been to about 12 nationals. I've been to a lot of sports fests in Chicago, which pretty big shows, very similar to the national in scope. Um, been to, you know, a lot of shows, TriStar shows. So I've, I've, I've set up as dealer at these shows. I've, I've been, you know, to just, you know, tons of shows in my lifetime. And the one thing that I will say is like, you know, when I was first going, I would, I would spend a lot of time preparing. All right. And what I was preparing for was the wrong thing. And I, and I kept doing it over and over. And what I would do is I would go through, create a list of cards I was going to look to buy. I would write down all the costs. This is before, you know, you could look things up so easily on your phones and everything when I first started going. So I'd actually have a list of pricing and comps with me of the cards I was looking to buy. And I would spend just hours and hours, you know, getting ready for the show by, you know, doing all this research and getting ready. And then go to the show and I'd have my list of 20 or 30 cards I really wanted to buy. And, you know, this would happen. <laughs> you would go there. I would go there. And of the 30 cards on the list, 25 of them wouldn't be there in the greater condition I was looking for. The five that were there that I was actually, you know, could find in the condition that I wanted to buy were all overpriced by 50 to 100%. And there you are, you know, at the National with virtually zero cards that you really want to buy because either you're going to have to pay a whole lot for them or uh, you're going to, um, you know, not buy anything. If that's, if you want to stick to your list, right? And that happened, you know, so many years in a row. I would, you know, I'll give you examples. Like, you know, when I was putting my Clemente master set together, um, you know, and at one point I thought I was going to do both the basic and the master set. And I've kind of given up on the master set, um, you know, um, just because it's almost impossible without just a ton of money to put that set together. Um, but I got the basic set done. I completed it last year. I got a video about it. You know, I did. I, I, finally, I finally finished my basic Clemente set and PSA eight or better. Um, with the one caveat is my rookie card still a seven. So I'm looking to upgrade that. But I went to the show looking for um, the, you know, the 68 3D for, for years, for I think three or four years in a row thinking that the national would have a 68 3d and a couple of times they did but guess what they were always in auctions that you you know for, that you couldn't actually buy they were just there as a preview for for an upcoming auction they weren't there for to to be bought or sold and so that was you know and i and i would you know bring money and cards to trade and and that was the card, number one card I was looking for for a lot of years. And then I finally kind of gave up on that card because it, it, it's just become, you know, like the impossible card to get because every Clemente collector needs it. And, you know, when one comes up, it's just like there's people who will pay whatever it takes to get it. Um, double, triple with the last one sold sometimes. So it's just, it's really a tough card to get, right? Um so there, you know, but that was an example of, you know, I would, I would really hype myself up that I'm going to go to the national, pick up the best Clemente card in the world. Um, you know, I had the, you know, cash and the money and the cards for it. And then I'd fail, you know, every time. And what I finally realized around 2017, 2016 is the preparation I needed to do was in getting my cards priced up, going to the, to the national and looking to sell, taking the money and then looking for good deals and look for cards that are underpriced. And, um, you know, that I've found to be the best strategy 
of anything. And, and the thing that makes that strategy work is that um, you, you're not going in with preset ideas of what you're going to do, right? You're not going in uh, with a hardcore, like, I'm going to only look for these two or three cards. Or if I don't find this one card, then the whole well, weekend's ruined, right? You're, you're going in with an idea of, like, anything's possible. I'm open to any sort of uh, deal or trade, right? And it served me very well because what I would do is not only would I, uh, you know, have uh, funding to, to, to pay for, you know, the, the opportunities by preparing in ahead of, you know, ahead. And again, that's to me, the preparation you should be doing is creating, you know, whatever money you're, you're going to have or whatever card you're going to bring now. I'm going to say this year's national is going to be different. So how I prepared for the previous nationals was I contacted dealers ahead of time and told them, you know, what I had and what I was looking to sell and, and my price ranges and my comps that I was looking at. And so I was already going to the show with people sort of on the hook, uh, willing to, to buy what I was bringing. So I didn't actually have to shop around my, cards or what I was going to sell, I'd already um, basically had an offer from multiple dealers and I'd already kind of made the deal. So all I had to do was show up, sell my cards, then start looking to buy. And I did that, you know, uh, three straight years, two of them to the same dealer, two years in a row, seamless transactions. We printed out all the, I had the cops all printed out. He reviewed them ahead of time. We negotiated the price over the internet, you know, over the over email, and it worked great. And I think that is the preparation I would suggest that people do if they're really serious about having a great show. Is you know determine how much money you want to have at the show. If you're going to sell cards, do it either ahead of time or you know network some dealers or find a way to talk to different people in the hobby to get to people who are looking to buy and and because they want that inventory for the show they don't want a sunday deal right to come up you know when, when everything's already done and, and you offer them cards on a sunday after you've you know been there for a couple of days they want the deal early so they can they can turn it around at the show or they want it before the show even happens so selling before the you know um you know, a month before the show starts is another good way of doing it. Um, but in this case, since, you know, I already had dealers, I knew were going to be there. It was easier just to do it, you know, within the first hour of the show. Um, and this worked really good. In fact, the dealers that I was working with, in fact, the, the two I sold the, you know, two years in a row to, um, he would actually give me passes and, uh, you know, uh, you know, VIP comps to get in early so that he could, make the deal early and have more time to, to move the inventory that I sold them. Right. Cause you know, I would come in, you know, with about 20 or $30,000 of, of, um, cards to sell to him. So, you know, he wanted time to, to move that inventory too. So he would actually give me VIP passes to get in early. So it was a win-win. It was, it was, it was business, right? That's how you do these kind of things. You want, you know, he wants to sell to me or I want to sell to him. But I want to make sure, you know, he's giving me the best deal. So he ensures that he wants that inventory. So he does things like, you know, uh, pay for a pass or whatever so I can get in early. You know, all that stuff works well. And that's the kind of preparation that people should be doing. You shouldn't be focused on cards that are going to be there. Because I want to tell you, this national I'm very concerned with for two reasons. One is... I'm not sure what kind of inventory is going to be there. I'm not sure it's going to be the type of inventory that people think is going to be there. Meaning that, you know, I'm not sure the vintage and, and, um, you know, let's say the more rare vintage cards are going to be there because I do feel like a lot of people are unloading the modern cards and there's going to be a lot of F1 Marvel, uh, the, these kind of, uh, kind of hot trendy cards, um, uh, that are going to take a lot of cases and so for me, you know, I go to the national, I'm looking for vintage. So, you know, that's really what I'm looking for. I can find the newer stuff sort of like 
every day on on ebay and other places and, and local shows but the harder to find vintage and in good condition is drying up a lot on on ebay and also you know i don't want to go through a lot of the auction houses and pay you know overpay as much as sometimes it brings in those auction houses i'd much rather be able to go to a show hold the card in hand see the condition make the deal um, in some cases if i still have cards left over i can trade somewhat or, or sell and then buy, you know, like it, it gives me a lot more flexibility than, than doing it that way. And that's usually how I look at these shows is an opportunity to buy uh, cool vintage cards. I may not have been able to uh, in, in another format because, again, it's you have the money, you're ready to go and the cards are there and you and sometimes they're willing to deal. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing. That's the preparation side of it. You know, don't go in thinking you're going to find certain cards. Because the other piece of it, besides availability, you know, is pricing. Now, we know the market's going on a downturn. And that is, you know, could be good and could be bad. The reason why I say it could be bad is this. And the number one indicator of how healthy this hobby is, is at card shows, how willing are dealers to buy. And... The trend I've been seeing at shows recently is dealers are starting to move out of the big cards, like trading down, so they can have cards that are smaller in, in value to be able to move them quicker. And um, they don't seem to be willing to trade as often or buy as much because they have inventory they need to move. So that could really be interesting at the national when the economy is for people to bring a lot of their inventory to try to move it to the national to, to move it into other inventory, right? A huge part of the national is, and just like what I talked about, is you bringing in the cards you want to sell, and then you're going to sell them and move them so you can buy other inventory or other cards you like better. And that's the ecosystem that makes the national so fun is a lot of trading, a lot of selling, a lot of buying, right? But if the trading and selling becomes very hard to do, or it's only for very select inventory, like, you know, only few types of cards are being really moved. Um, that's going to be really tough for a lot of folks who are looking to make the national fun by, you know, moving some inventory and, and, and buying other things. So that's why I say if you prepare yourself going into it by talking to dealers or, you know, pre-selling basically your inventory before you get there, you may not have to deal with that because walking around the show talking to dealer after dealer saying here's what i got no you interested and in general the reason why you do this too is the idea of cherry picking right so if you're going to go and, and, and sell cards to the national my advice is try to try to sell everything at once um, because if you allow dealers to cherry pick what you're going to find is that by the third dealer that you've allowed to, to cherry pick your inventory you don't have enough good cards or big cards left probably to, to move. And then you'll just be spending a lot of time trying to move those, <clears throat> let's say lesser or, you know, lesser value or not as uh, hot cards versus trying to, to, to buy other cards or, or spending time doing other things that are more fun. And, and that's happened to me before where I'm, you know, let's say I, I need $10,000 to, to, you know, cause I know that's, you know, what I need to, to, to buy something or to, you know, what my goal was to, to for cash that show. And I get to 6,000 because I sold the three or four really big cards that people really want. And I got $4,000 of, of, of a lot more smaller cards and they're harder to move. Do I spend five hours of the show trying to move those cards? Or do I just take the money I have and just go shopping and, and, and try to have a fun? It's one of those things that, that you get into and then it makes the show less fun because you're spending a lot of time just trying to hustle and move your inventory versus trying to, you know, find new inventory to buy and, and, and cards and have fun. You know, whether it's ripping packs or getting cards graded or whatever you're doing in the show, you know, getting autographs. You can't do that when you're trying to like flip cards, you know, or sell cards. So, and that, you know, so just think that, keep that in mind. You know, e even if you're taking a less percentage on the entire deal, it's still probably better from a enjoyment and even from a time perspective to probably sell everything at once, you know, you know, if, cause if you just can't, you know, 
average it out and let's say you make an extra four to five hundred dollars that's significant to a lot of people but you know maybe it's not worth another five hours of your time so you have to weigh that out and just think about it a little bit when you're trying to move these kind of cards and 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 you know a lot of inventory at once at a show or just some really big cards at a show where you know maybe you know maybe what you're trying to unload some lebron james cards james cards they're not hot right now and you have to really work hard to try to get whatever you want out of them versus um you know you have some steph curry's in there you've got some mike trout's which is a little hot a little cool you know you've got some hot and cold cards all at once and and either you let people cherry pick it or you try to move it all at once and you just got to really try to figure out what's the best thing to do but my advice always is is try to move it all at once if you can find one dealer who's willing to to give you a little bit more on the big cards that are hot and a little less on the, the colder stuff but averages out to what you can you know accept then that, that might be the best way to go um and you know the one thing i you know you have to keep in mind too is you know once you've kind of established you know what you have in terms of bankroll, what you're going to be able to spend, the show does get a lot more fun. You know, I think that's how it goes. Is that once you've, you know, really figured out, you know, okay, this is what I what I can actually spend, or this is what I've got to go out and, and acquire. Uh, that's when the show, to me, gets really, really interesting and fun because then you've taken care of like the business side of it. <clears throat> now, the one thing that everyone's going to talk about, I think, you know, is you know, you'll hear it a lot. And so, you know, I'll say it again. This is going to be a, definitely a cash is king show. Uh, due to taxes, due to everything that's coming in the hobby, you're going to find that, you know, having cash versus cards to trade or even PayPal, that you're going to find that people are going to be like, I'll give you 5%, 10% discount just to do cash deals only. I think that is a leverage that, you know, you can definitely look at in this show. But I also say, you know, having cards. So in years past, you know, if you, let's say, had $20,000 in cards plus 10000 in cash, and you said, you know, I've got $30,000 to spend in the show because I've got $20,000 in, 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 in cash value cards. Like it's, you know, they're at 70, 80% of comp is worth $20,000. 10,000 in, in, in cash. I, now I, you know, but my 10,000 in cash is in PayPal. Um, I would say that when you get to that show, you may not get $20,000 for your cards because maybe not enough people, you can't find enough people who want to buy them. Nobody wants to really do PayPal as much, you know, maybe at the show or, you know, it's all friends and family, you know, maybe, but you know, that still can be tagged. So, um, you know, they would rather just have the cash. So, you may have to be thinking about, you know, bringing cash, you know, directly to the show because if you haven't pre-aligned with a dealer to sell, you're going to have to you know, shop around. Um, you know, you may not actually have the $30,000 in funds you thought you had um, to, to have, you know, at the show. And, and that always, you know, does make the, the weekend less fun when, you know, you thought you were going to have a certain amount to spend and you have a lot less. And again, I'm yeah, I'm using numbers like thirty thousand. I mean, it could be three hundred dollars, you know, it could be you know three thousand dollars. You know, it doesn't matter what the number is. It's just if you thought you were going to have a certain amount to to enjoy yourself, and you don't get it, um, you know, for whatever reason, it really uh, does kind of make it less fun. But you know, I do think leveraging cash to get a discount is a lot more uh, feasible and reasonable to do at this show. And again, I think if you look at it and you say, look, you know, selling me this card at the show, you know, you're not paying any fees from an auction house or eBay, plus you get straight cash, you know, that's worth 10 to 15% of a discount from full comp. You know, I, I think that is perfectly a reasonable way to go into a lot of transactions and especially on modern cards, right? Something that uh, may, you know, be, rare but you know it's still somewhat modern and, and could have some uh, volatility and variability that you'd want to uh, you know hedge against a little bit so i, I would definitely uh, encourage people to do that especially if you can get uh, <clears throat> your cards converted to cash uh, prior to the show or, or at the show and instead of uh, having a high you know paypal 
balance, you just go and cash it out. That's probably your best advantage on uh, going to the show. So, um, so as far as these other channels talking about preparing for the show, you know, and, and, you know, going with goals and all this stuff, I, I, I just don't think going in expecting a certain cards to be there, or certain prices is, is the way to go. Go in with, you know, an open mind, open yourself up to looking at other things because that's part of the experience is seeing something you've never seen before and, and having fun with it. But, you, you know, don't be so rigid that you can't have fun and you can't really, um, you know, find anything you like because the one thing that you really truly wanted isn't there. Because <clears throat> to me, that's not what the national is about. And, and that's the myth of the national is that everything's going to be there um, that you could ever want. And I'm going to tell you, like, that's not going to happen. It's furthest from the truth. And in general, even if you do find it, it's probably going to be overpriced to some extent. Um, and that's that, and that's sort of what makes people kind of like, hey, the National isn't that great, or it's not as good as I thought it was going to be, because the one card I was looking for, I found it, but the guy had it for double, triple what I was going to pay for it. And, uh, you know, or the, the common thing you hear is, I found this card, but I could find it cheaper on eBay than the National. And that does happen quite a bit, too. Um, and I know a lot of people who go to the National, sell a bunch of their cards, and then end up just buying cards off eBay when they get to their hotel room because it's cheaper than what's at the show. So in that case, you know, that's not quite what what the experience you think you're going to have. But, you know, but being open-minded and seeing deals and looking for something at the show that you may not have been thinking about, to me, is is how you have a lot of fun. So... That's it. That's my little advice on how to prepare and not really prepare for the national. Um, and, you know, don't get fooled into thinking that you know, the national is going to have every card in the world there that you could ever want to buy. Um, it's not uh, I mean, and again, pricing may be a problem when you get there. So that's it. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, if you want more um, of my experience of the national, let me know in the comments. Um, I definitely have cards I picked up there that uh, were once in a lifetime opportunity. So that does happen, so you have to be open-minded to those opportunities uh, when they come along. And I think that's how you kind of grow some collections and, and get some things into your collection that, that you didn't think about, but then are awesome and amazing cards that you, you are glad you did. So there it is, and I'll see you next time on Cards and Comics. Bye.